In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, we are going to talk about the top Spanish prospects for the 2024 NBA Draft. I got my brother James with me again. I thought he did such a good job on the French prospects Appreciate that I had to bring him back for the Spanish prospects. Now, France has a lot of NBA talent coming out of their country, but they've been losing to Spain in a lot of the national competitions. So I want to get James's opinion on why is that, but we're going to talk about four Spanish prospects that could be drafted in 2024 NBA draft and maybe, just maybe, even first round picks. Stay tuned. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board. Got my brother James here. And this episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the official sports book of Locked On. Make every moment more right now. If you are a new customer, listen, if you are a new customer, you can bet $5, just 5 bucks, and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Like, share, subscribe, comment. That's a demand or is it a command? It's both. Both. We want you to like, we want you to share, subscribe, comment. That is the best way to help us grow the YouTube channel. And also you can leave a rating on your podcast, wherever you're listening. Let's get right into this episode. All right, let's get to it. So I want to hear your thoughts on Ethan Almanza. So I'll share mine first. Go ahead. So I can't deny his resume. And... You can make a case and say you can put his resume up against any international prospects as far as on the junior level. And it's going to be hard to find someone that has won three MVPs at the U-17s, U-18s, U-19s. He's won multiple gold medals. I mean, his resume is impressive. And when I watched him play, I wasn't blown away by his NBA fit in a sense mm. he is a guy that's very productive a good motor but sometimes he's hard i feel like it's hard to put him in a box because he's not a great athlete he doesn't space the floor he does a lot of things well he's not like a great shot blocker but then you're like dang this dude is productive he knows how to play he knows how to play then i went to watch him play in Las Vegas at when he at when they might had the G League Fall Invitational and my concern going into that was how is he going to look if he doesn't have really good point guards to set him up and get him those open looks because one thing about Spanish prospects or Spain as a country mm -hmm. they going to produce a point guard that knows how to run the pick and roll shout out to Sergio Rodriguez I mean he's Sergio Yui is one of my favorites Rubio I mean they they have guys that know how to run an offense and and get their bigs shout involved shout out to Juan Carlos Navarro <laughs> The man with the deep floater. Yeah. So without Monza, I was wondering, like, all right, how is he going to look in the G League? And then one of the things that Jason Hart did that I thought was genius was he always had him on the floor with Jeremy Pargo. I was going to say Gennaro. But he had him on the floor with Jeremy Pargo, mm. who's a veteran who's not, you know, playing for his numbers. He's there to help develop. When... Almonte was on the floor with Pargo. He found him. You saw how effective he is on the roll, getting tap outs, extra rebounds. And his game has grown on me. I don't have him in my lottery just yet. I mean, it was just two preseason games. But I see his NBA role. You can't put him into a box as, you know, like your vertical lob threat slash rim protector or floor spacer. He's just a ball player. Okay. So that's my thoughts on it. All right. Him. I want to hear yours. Do you want to hear my notes or do you want to just get right to the comparison? Just get right. Just, just get, I got a comparison and I hope your comparison ain't mine. I've already said mine publicly. What's your comparison? Joachim Noah. Here's why I think he got a little bit of Noah in his game. Okay. And maybe it's a Florida thing, because last we talked about the French guys. You compared Risa Share to Corey Brewer, <laughs> our Florida guys. All right, so 
Go ahead. I mean, Noah's game is not visually pleasing. You don't like, as a kid, you don't watch Noah play like <laughs> at the park like Noah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I want to play like that. But he rebounded. Okay. He could pass. Okay. Like the little things, not like creating for others all the time, but just the dribble handoffs into the screens. Okay. Got extra possessions. Could bring the ball up court. Could kind of initiate the offense a little bit in the half court. Well, Noah could. Not a little bit. I mean, I think there was one year, I think 13-14 season. He was really the Bulls' point center. Yeah. He had MVP votes. Yeah, there. I think he was top five in MVP voting. Didn't space the floor. Again, wasn't like playing above the rim. Just knew how to play and contributed to winning. And that's okay. what I think our monster is. And that's not a complexion comparison. <laughs> I think there, <laughs> I think there's some similarities in a sense. You okay. just got to throw out the, you know, the boxes that you you, you put bigs in. I, I I I dig it. I dig it. You know who I had him as? Who? Anderson Verja. Uh, I mean, now that's the the one that I hear all the time. That could be a complexion. No, but hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. Right? He's got. He's great on the glass. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. And then just to backtrack, we were talking about the French brothers, uh, Piran, you was like, man, this dude doesn't space the floor. To me, Almanza should space the floor because he's he should be trying to space the floor. And I, I think in the in the international they played the night played in Singapore at the international it's called the FIBA International Intercontinental Cup. I think he made one or two threes in, in those games. I saw him shoot one three. Uh, when I saw, when I watched his um, under, is it under 19? Uh, it's, it's easy to get him confused. The last time he played with Spain, he shot 1-3. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, and it was like his first possession, you know, essentially it counts back. Because I was thinking he was going to be out here shooting threes and uh, he really didn't. So I wish he spaced the floor. But again, Anderson Vera's shot, all right? Look, um, long, fluid, not a dunker. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, great rebounder. Um, I think Almonte has a great touch around the rim. Great, I mean, great weird touching. angles. Yeah. I mean, Jason Hart told me that he's got a sky hook. He yeah. said he hasn't used it, but he's like he's got a sky, not not a running hook. He said he's got a Korean okay. sky hook. So when you have that, you got touch. Right. So that's why I think the three point shooting could come along, even though. It, it's like a 50% foul shooter, though. Right. That's why it's confusing because his touch around the rim, I mean, the angles mm -hmm. are great. It's, it's weird because it just seems like the further he goes out, the touch disappears. In yeah. Because I can't look at his free throw form or even when he sh does shoot threes and say, oh, that's a beautiful form that I – that I just think with more reps, it's going to be money. Yeah. But then again, you look at the touch around the rim, the angles from moving, it's, it's incredible. So do you think that he can't expand his range? I don't Other know. Than you, I know you feel like he probably needs to, but do you think he can? Well, if you believe that free throw percentage is an indicator of touch, it's just wild because he makes push shots, but he can't shoot free throws and he doesn't shoot threes. I don't know. Like, is I, there another player that that's like that that you can think of in the NBA that just has great touch around the rim? That once they get to the foul line, they're not as good as you think they should be. It was somebody that I had in mind. I can't think of who it is, but I, I just haven't seen someone that has that type of touch around the basket that I'm worried about. Can he expand his range? Yeah. Um, but the thing, just talking about him, the thing about him, he has great touch around the basket, but I think he relies on his touch around the basket too much in the sense that I saw he had uh, under 19, I think it was. He had 59 possessions in the paint. He only dunked the ball seven times. But is that us just wanting? Okay, but hold on, hold on, hold on. So, again, of those seven dunks, Five of them were in transition. transition. Yeah, he had one dunk against Turkey. He caught a body. Mm -hmm. So like, and it wasn't like he's not like he doesn't have the athleticism or the length. It's does he have the mindset to say, you know what, 
I'm about to put this dude in the can right now. And I think that, I mean, of course, that's what you like, but I'm like, he just finishes so well. Am I nitpicking because I want him to dunk more? And that's why I'm like, he's a good athlete, but he's not like, again, your DeAndre Jordan where he's playing above no, no, the no, rim no. and he's. But I would want you to, okay, so like, totally separate argument. Sometimes I think DeAndre Aiden needs to dunk on people and he doesn't dunk on people. Yeah. So I just. But, all right, I'm sorry to cut you. Yeah, no, you just you want to you want to see that level of just aggression. Yeah, if that, nothing that else, meanness. If you, that if you can do it, yeah, if you can do it. Now, if you Jokic, you don't got to. No, no, no. But, he, but Jokic will elbow you in the head, so that that's a different level. Yeah, of dog. push you in the back. Hey man, don't push him. <laughs> <laughs> right when we return, we can talk a little bit more about Almanza, but also I want to talk about Baba Miller, very divisive prospect that. I can't lie. I was sold on Baba Miller last year. Now I have, I have some doubts. But before we get into that, I want to talk to you about none other than FanDuel. Snap into the NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get two hundred dollars, two hundred dollars in bonus bets, guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. And if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time than to get into the action right now because basketball season is here. Football season is definitely here. And the app is so easy to use. James is a big FanDuel user. And which, which betting options do you use? I like to play uh tournaments man what, what's the tournaments for those that don't know uh you know pick a set of guys you got a salary cap um you're trying to find a sleeper who's going to push you over the top who's going to get you that win um you know shout out to nicole jovich who robbed me last night but you know hey it's what it is <laughs> so you're playing fanduel in the preseason oh yeah man you know i like i love basketball man you know why not so the app is easy to use and there is a wide range of betting options from spreads, player props, overs, unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL and NBA season. All right, when we left off, we was talking about Ethan Almanza. And we can go on and on talking about him. Anderson Verjao, man. That's you good. You say Anderson Verjao. Real quick, before we go, before we look, Anderson Verjao had two seasons where he averaged like 14 and 12. Like, he had some productive seasons. So, yeah. again, he was a first-round first, first round pick, late first-round pick, carved out a long career. Um, I don't know about jo uh, Joaquin, but I see that, like, energy rebounding, great roller. Tap out. But it's the passing. Like, he is just. Yeah, Verjao is a, great, a very good passer as a center, too. But I see Almanza as a guy that if he gets the rebound, he can push it up. Yeah. Virgil, to my knowledge, wasn't bringing the ball up court like that. And then what Almanza can do that reminds me a little bit of Noah is he can get a rebound, push the ball up court, and then get right into the action yeah. with a DHO. And he just does... All the little things that contribute to winning. Last thing about Amon's and your Joe King comparison. Is he the defender? Can he defend like Joe Kim Noah? I think he can be. One, because he has the, the motor and the energy to be a good defender. I think the size right now is probably the biggest concern. And when I talked to Jason Hart about him, Jason Hart was like, look, he's not going to be 18 forever. And he's like, he's not going to be that size once he bulks up and gets stronger. Because I felt like he's not a four or a five. And I just kind of had a hard time figuring out, like, what to do with him. Looking at the production and so on. I, and I think he could be one of the guys when we do this episode called Don't Overthink It, which mm -hmm. we talked about earlier this week. I think he could be a guy that. You just don't overthink. You just don't overthink because he plays, he's productive. I'm looking forward to seeing what he does this season, especially on the non-Pargo minutes. Okay. But he's benefited greatly by playing with really good guards in Spain. All right, let's talk about Baba Miller. Okay. I did a video this summer called 
is the hype real or something like that? And I was talking about Baba Miller. I was sold on Baba coming into last season. 6'11", 6'10"-ish wing skills, was a point guard, had a growth spurt, kept his same fluidity, mobility, some passing skills. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, he was unfairly penalized by the NCAA for 16 games. I think it was like $2,500 or something racks. like three, yeah. three grand, whatever. I mean, they pink. <laughs> That's all different. <laughs> and then I thought like he was going to show flashes of, I thought he was going to be productive. Florida State was a bad team. I thought, hey, it's an opportunity for you to come in and maybe help win a couple games. And if you could see my face, <laughs> if you're listening, I was disappointed. Very disappointed what I saw out of him. Again, I see the flashes and why teams would be intrigued by him because of the size, the length. I'm not a fan of his shooting now because I think the release is so low. But that's my thoughts. I've talked about Baba Miller multiple times. I want to hear your thoughts on Baba Miller. You know, going into this, I didn't know too much about Baba Miller. I heard the name. And I was disappointed, man. <laughs> like, I, he's long. And he's fluid. What else does he do? I think there's potential to be like a switchy defender. And I know you don't like three and D guys. No, well, I don't. I, I, let me let me rephrase that. You don't like. I don't like. I don't like. I don't I'll like let you explain it. I don't like you coming into the league as a three and D guy. Now, if you turn into one, like watch this. Watch this. Perfect segue. Shout out to Imani Bates. Right, Imani Bates. It's still early on him, too, right? But he went from the next KD to whatever he had going on at Memphis. And prior to Memphis, he's like, he had a very good summer league. He's like turned himself into what I think could be a good 3 and D, where I've and dialed it back. it's going to open up once exactly. he gets paid. Exactly. So he's dialed it back to, I'm not missing any catch and shoot threes, but... When necessary, I can put the ball on the ground and create for myself. That's the kind of 3 and D I like. Not to just stand in the corner, stand in the corner. You don't like guys that can't attack a close Exactly. Like, and this is on a, a little tangent here. I'm a James Harden fan. I'm a James Harden apologist. And there are some times where I just can't defend some of the, the, the postseason performances. But I feel like when he was with Houston, if they just had one wing that could attack a closeout, I feel like they would have beat Golden State that year. They had so many wings that yeah. if they caught the ball. They, if they didn't have an open shot, they had to get it back to him. Or Gerald Green would catch the ball and he would take two dribbles. And then, you know, if Gerald Green takes that second yeah, dribble, he's going launching up. it. Yeah. So anyway... I get that. Yeah. I get exactly what you're saying. And it's yeah. funny because I was just listening to the Knuckleheads podcast, and Doral Wright talked about that's what he had to turn himself into. The three and D guy. Because he he could score, and he said sitting the bench all those years in Miami. I think it was like seven years, six or seven years mm -hmm. that he was like he worked on his game, but he knew that that was his role because he said when they drafted him, they were young with Karan Butler. Right. And then he said they traded for Shaq, and then I said no, we oh we got to win development to. Yeah, but let's bring that back to Baba Miller, right? So Baba Miller looks like a three and D guy now at Florida State. I can't recall more than a handful of times of him putting the ball on the ground to attack the closeout. Now maybe they he didn't have to because he couldn't shoot at Florida State and they're not making him dribble. Mm -hmm. So it's like I don't know what he's good at right now. Um, and again, I know that at half season probably threw off everything and his timing is just interesting to see like, who is he and what will he become? So like watching him under 19, uh, we'll say under 19 mm -hmm. in Spain, um, it was kind of just more of the same thing. You know, I'm, I'm here, I'm gonna shoot threes. He did put the ball on the ground a little bit. I saw he caught a bomb late clock. And against Argentina, and he hit somebody with a between the legs. Like, and again, I'm not telling, I'm not saying guys gotta go be Julian Newman, <laughs> Pat the Rock, Bone Collector, any of those brothers. But can you create offense for yourself? Is what I'm saying. And I just don't see that from him enough. And then I just, yeah, I don't know what is he. He's long. He's athletic. What else does he do?
I'm, I'm just read some numbers. At Florida State, four points, three rebounds, 47, 25, 30. Yo, 30 shooting is excusable, man. 30. I don't care if you only took 10 free throws. <laughs> this is three out of 10 is bad. I have real concerns about the shooting. So here is, so I did this episode um, about is the hype real? And then I wrote an article on NBA Big Board about him. And this is what I say. It's easy to fall in love with his tools and imagine what he can be. But will he live up to the hype and expectations? He's a gifted athlete that retained his guard skills, fluidity and mobility after a late nine inch growth spurt He's got the tools and the length to be a disruptive defender that can guard all over the floor. But I got concerns about his shot and finding a defined role in the NBA. Mm. He has a low release on his shot that turns open looks into contested jumpers. He only made three out of his 10 free throws. It's a small sample size, but he only made 57% of his free throws at the U19s and only 25.8% of his jump shots. You know, to be six eleven, that fluid. Um, I, you know, ten free throws is a very low number, but to shoot that many free throws in fifteen games, like it's like you should be getting to the rack more. You should be at least crashing the glass, something. You know, I just I don't know, man. He just leaves a lot to be desired just watching this film. If you're an NBA GM and you trust, and we've done player development with NBA players, Euroleague players. If you're an NBA GM and you trust your player development, that's what it comes down to with him. Would you take him in the first round if you are a team picking 20 through 30? No. No, but that's today. That's today, October 11th. He's going back to Florida State, right? Yep. Ask me again in January. Which is fair. Again, you know, again, I know the circumstance, man. Sometimes stuff happens. You know, I don't, I don't want to write anybody off. But today, no. I know he missed the 16 games, and I think right after he got back. Then he get hurt, too? Then he got sick or something like that. So I'm, I have some concerns. The shooting is a concern for me because if you can't shoot, I don't care how great of a defender you are. Unless he turns himself into Jared Vanderbilt. Right. But, okay, so look, check this out. He couldn't shoot either, I believe, but Scotty Barnes at Florida State showed he was putting the ball on the ground. He was filling the stat sheet. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, like, there's an opportunity for him to to do that at Florida State. So, again, today in October, no. January, maybe we'll see. Well, that wraps up this episode. Once again, big shout out to you, the listener, for making the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. I am on my way to Spain. So in the very near future, you're going to hear me do episodes on what I saw in Spain and just learn a little bit more about the development of Spanish prospects. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow, James Barlow, and we are out. <laughs>